Hey, and good afternoon. This is Angela Brown, and I'm here today with James Copeland, and I am super excited about today's show because we've got so many interesting things happening today. James is the Director of Technical Services at Prism Specialties, and he's going to help us unpack appliances and how to keep them clean and how to make sure that they're in working order. Now, this is a really, really interesting niche. And I cannot tell you how excited I am today to hear from a specialist about appliances because I get a lot of questions and we do it the best we can as cleaners, but from somebody who has the technical know-how, that's a whole different ballgame. So please help me welcome James Copeland. Yay. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. And I want to say hi to our friends. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have MCF here who says, what is, what is the best way to clean cast iron stove grates? So we'll answer that question. We have uh, Natalie Jones says, yay, I made it for a live stream. Yay, Natalie, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us, especially on a holiday weekend. Yes. And we've got Rachel Rose. Rachel is from England. So Rachel, hello, and thank you for joining us again. We've got uh, Pease Lehman that says, same. And you guys, I'm so excited. Uh, we have... Uh, Padmini Mayor, who says, how often should I clean my fridge? And Prudence says, yay, thank you so much for all you do. And Miserman says, great to see you. You guys, this is just so awesome. I'm so glad you guys are joining me. All right, well, let's jump in. And before we answer your questions, because I want to make sure that we um, we do a little bit of background and you guys get to know James. And so I'm going to have him explain to us real quick what he does and the, the role of his company and, and how he got started in that. Yeah, well, thank you, Angela. It's great to be here. Um, so after I um, received an honorable discharge from the United States Navy, I came back to the States and around the age of 19, I uh, received employment from a local dry cleaners and they had about 25 to 28 stores. And I was responsible for maintaining and cleaning all their equipment from steam presses to dry cleaning machines, chillers, boilers, washers, dryers, the list just goes on and on. Um, so that's where I started to really learn that commercial side of this equipment and some of the techniques in cleaning different stainless steel. A lot of steam presses had uh, really thick stainless steel and there's certain ways to clean and wax those, different ways to clean boilers. Um, so I was there for about eight years and then I moved into the commercial market, market segment where I was then into coin operated equipment. I was installing coin uh, equipment, dryers, washers, getting into nursing homes and hospitals and, and cleaning, installing and repairing those. Um, and it just kept advancing. It kept moving through the years. I was in that 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 market for about 20 plus years. Uh, and I got into the industrial market segment as well, where they're doing they're ironing uh, millions and pounds, washing tunnel washers that are 60 feet long to 14 feet high, washing 650 pounds of mats and clothes at one time. So I started to get into that really heavy industry, um, into the commercial market segment, and it just kept moving right through there, through nursing homes. So sanitation was important. Uh, I've seen chemicals go right through stainless steel on some of the commercial, uh, the chemicals that are injected would eat right through stainless. And I thought stainless was like the toughest of the toughest, but corrosive materials can absolutely, absolutely eat through it, including like bleach and ammonia over a prolonged time. Um, it was about 2013 after having that experience in the commercial laundry world um, that uh, I was on a children's, um, I was a chairman of fundraising for a children's dyslexia center. And one of the board members says, hey, I got a job opportunity. You want a, a new job? I'm like, hey, I'm ready for growth. I have been. I've, I've done all this. I'm ready to see something different. And he goes, well, I work with a disaster restoration company and we need a, a technical trainer. You know, and, and we need somebody to train our franchises uh, to clean electronics and appliances in removing the byproducts from fire and water damage. So I received my training and I became a technical trainer, uh, teaching people how to clean the various electronics, computers, TVs, and appliances and removing those byproducts from those type of events. Um, through there, I've been here now like about 10 years. I've been with uh, Prism Specialties uh, and I'm still in the training. Uh, I, I moved from a technical trainer to an application engineer where I started to look at more like commercial losses 
uh, you know, medical facilities that had fires? What, you know, what happens to, to those substrates from, you know, different materials burning into restaurants, you know, that obviously have a lot of stainless steel and the things we're going to talk about today. So I was exposed to that for the last 10 years and I'm, I still do that role. And as I went from those roles into a business consultant, I got to see the business side a little bit and I moved into my current role which is director of technical services, which I look at additional service lines. I, I do research and development. So I got to dive into, uh, you know, I got certified in tablet and device repair. So I was repairing cell phones and understood, you know, how intricate those surfaces are and the different things that can damage that if you clean it inappropriately. Uh, so that's where I'm at today. Uh, so for 2024, I hope to continue to move forward with different research and development and looking at best practices for cleaning all the new devices, cleaning the new consumer electronics and appliances that come out with different finishes. You know, you got manufacturer recommendations and, and how much do you deviate from that to get rid of some of those neglected, built up grease and grime that we can get because humans can tend to be distracted. And mm -hmm. when you're distracted and ovens get dirtier and your refrigerator or your dryer gets dirtier, it gets harder to clean. So you want to think about what materials and products that you use to clean that so you don't damage the surfaces and void any type of warranties. So that, that's a little bit of my background, where I come from. Uh, and I, I would say I'm heavily on the repair side, but I've been a lot more in the last 10 years heavy on the cleaning side. Well, that is a wealth of information. And you just gave me about 50 questions that I want to ask. <laughs> And I'm, I'm really curious because I, I didn't ever think about chemicals eating through stainless steel and through all those commercial uh, machines. And I wonder, are there things that we're doing as homeowners that are damaging our own machines as far as cleaning chemicals that we're using or applying them the wrong ways? Or what are some of the mistakes that you see homeowners making with just the appliances that they have? And we'll take washing machines as an example, because that's that's a good place to start. Absolutely. First off, it's going to the, the owner's manual. Okay. Understanding when appliances are built, there's different grades of different metals. Stainless steel on an appliance in your home is a different grade stainless steel in a restaurant. It's a lot thicker. It's a, it can take a lot more abuse. So reading that manual is incredibly important to understand it. But I will tell you in my research and experience, it's using the least abrasive, most minimal approach you can to any type of appliance. Stainless steel in particular, we have so many different types of stainless steel and your normal consumer consumer appliances, you got uh, you different type of finishes, you got black stainless, you know, uh, you have slate and black slate and all those require different cleaning, but there's a commonality between them all. And it boils down to a microfiber cloth in warm water. The best measure you can take is clean up spills immediately and wipe it down I'm compulsive with it. I'll be honest. I'm OCD when I'm cooking and I do all the cooking and the whole time I'm cooking, I'm cleaning up the grease, grease splatter. And I got separate microfiber cloths for different cleaning methods. So if I'm using it for grease, they stay with grease. They're grouped together. They're yellow. Okay. If I'm using a stainless steel polish, I might use blue. And that's what I use for my stainless steel surfaces. So as I develop these habits, and, and that's what's most important, developing consistent habits. If you have a new appliance, start right out the gate with wiping down after every single use. Uh, if you use a mild detergent, pretty much across the board, mild detergent, you can clean everything, even a TV screen. Panasonic recommends cleaning their sc TV screens with a 100 to 1 ratio of filtered water to your dishwasher, mild dishwasher detergent. Um, so when you say a mild dishwasher detergent or a, a mild detergent, are you talking about like a drop of dish soap inside a, a spray bottle of water or something? Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Yes, absolutely. Like Dawn into dish soap. It's like a 101 to ratio. I can't do the math off the top of my head right now, but you're absolutely right. Just you got some water and you put a little squirt, you know, a couple drops of dish soap in there just to get it foamy and that that'll help. But anytime and I could the best advice I can give anybody, whether it's dish soap or whether it's any type of commercial grade cleaner, removing that chemical residue is the most important thing is a clean microfiber 
with clean filtered water so it doesn't have mineral deposits and wiping that clean in a dry cloth to buff it out is really your best safest non-toxic method. You don't have to breathe nasty fumes, but if you neglect it, you're going to have to use some extra aggression to get those cooked off grease or fingerprints or food smudges off. It's going to take a little bit more elbow grease. And if that don't work, it takes a little bit more aggressive cleaner. All right. So uh, we've got top 10 tips here about cleaning. And the first one that I heard you say was that we want to use the least abrasive materials possible. So the least abrasive chemicals for wiping everything down. Tip number two I heard was consistency. I have a feeling we're going to go through a whole lot more tips <laughs> than just 10, but let's let's go with the least abrasive and then uh, consistency and then using a mild detergent on pretty much all of your appliances. So there are three right off the bat, and we've only been doing this for less than 10 minutes. So that is amazing as far as moving forward with what we're going to do. I got a question when you talk about uh, fingerprints and appliances mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and you're, it sounds like you're in the kitchen right now. If that's the case, lots of us have stainless steel appliances and we touch the, the handles of the dishwasher, the microwave, and there are all these fingerprints that even when you wipe them off, the fingerprints are still there. And so how do you get those off? So a mild dish soap can work. If that doesn't work, vinegar is a good route to go. But keep in mind that vinegar is an acidic acid and it's on a pH scale, I say two to three, about, about 2.5 is, uh -huh. is where that is. And it depends on the type of vinegar you're using. It can be good at removing mineral stains. And that's oftentimes what we see. We're going to handle the water. If we have hard water in our hands or we just touch the cleaner and then we go and touch the handle as we're throwing dishes in and moving things, that might leave some residue, maybe some fats, maybe some proteins. I would suggest going with if the warm water and the microfiber don't work, the next step would be mild dish soap. OK, and if, and if that don't work then I would look at the product manual and start to look at what recommendations they say for all purpose cleaners and stainless steel cleaners. So it depends on what substrate you're talking about of what type of cleaner and method that you wanna use. So some manufacturers, I think Whirlpool will suggest a lot of a, a fresh products and a fresh has a full line. Uh, Barkeepers has a full line of cleaners. So if your manufacturer don't recommend something, I would really recommend on using, um, translate it to something that's like kind and quality to what you have, to what that appliance is and whatever mm -hmm. that appliance is. And if they're making a recommendation and they're saying, use Cascade inside my dishwasher, then I would use something that has similar um, chemicals that are in that cleaner. And you can find the safety data sheet online between all of them. It'll share the pH of them. It'll share the, the different chemicals that are in it. So if a manufacturer says, don't use ammonia, don't use ammonia, it'll discolor long-term. As a matter of fact, Sub-Zero will tell you, Sub-Zero has a better quality stainless steel. And if you use ammonia on it, you got to rinse it right away. Otherwise you'll get a hazing effect. Whereas like my LG appliances, I would never use ammonia on it. It's a thicker, different type of stainless steel. It has more of a sheen, a finish to it. And I don't want to cause hazing. That may not, it may happen too quick for me to be able to rinse it off and not have that, that a side effect from that particular cleaner. So I'd always work my way up. And if I was like, oh, I can't get rid of it. I would go to the manual and look at the manual and see what they recommend. So that way I know what type of all-purpose cleaner to use, what type of stainless steel cleaner to use. You made a really good point about checking the owner's manual. So I'm going to call that tip number four, check the owner's manual. Yes. And I completely agree with this because there are a lot of appliances that even though they look like stainless steel, they have like uh, maybe they have like a finish that is like a, a stainless steel finish but maybe it has like a blue tint to it, a slightly blue tint, or maybe it's like a film that was wrapped over the top of it. And maybe it's not a, an honest stainless steel. And so oddly enough, and we've discovered this in cleaning where sometimes we'll go into a customer's house and we assume that it's honest to goodness through and through stainless steel. And it's not, it's, it's, a, it's got a finish on it. And then if you use a strong chemical on it, like James said, sometimes it can discolor and then you're left wondering, oh no, how do I fix that? And so yeah, exactly <laughs> knowing what you're dealing with is awesome. So I love this. And I'm going to call tip number four, the reading the owner's manual. 
Now, James said something that he sneaked in there, and I want to I want to unpack it really quickly for those of you that just think, oh, I, I can just clean any kind of appliance I want and just kind of experiment as I go. He talked about the safety data sheets, and I'm a huge fan of reading the safety data sheets, which every single manufacturer and and that, that creates chemicals is required by law to provide. And so you can just do a Google search for um, whatever the cleaning chemical is. And James mentioned Barkeeper's Friend. It's one of my favorite products for stainless steel. And it's because it's been around for 138 years and it was designed for stainless steel. And so when we have like the water drops that drip down from where you put your cup in and the water drips down on the fridge or the water drips down like from your hands on the fronts of the dishwasher and you've got those like streaks that seem like they'll never come out. If you'll take some barkeeper's friend in your hand and you'll just spray your hand with a spray bottle or you'll just add a couple drops of water so it's damp and you'll take just a damp cloth and wrap your finger in it and tap it so that there's not a lot of barkeeper's friend, not a lot, but you'll go over those areas with the grain of the stainless steel. It will remove those really icky, sticky mineral deposits that are like etched in to the stainless steel. And then you can just buff it off, wipe it off with a clean, damp cloth, and then buff it off, and it's good to go. I mean, it looks great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, but be really careful. Through. Be really careful mm -hmm. and, and read the safety data sheets if you're not sure. So I'm going to say safety data sheets is number five. So yeah. we're, we're rocking and rolling here. Thank you, James. <laughs> We've got a couple Absolutely. of questions. You were talking about um, microfiber cloths. And Natalie Jones says, what about uh, how to wash the cleaning rags with a variety of chemicals? Does this damage the washing machine? That's a great question. Yeah, so washing machine seals are meant to handle a lot of different things that go into it. Um, certain things that can damage the washing, uh, the, the seals and washers, in my experience, uh, are more acidic type things. So believe it or not, vinegar uh, can be a little slightly acidic for some seals. While some use it and they don't see immediate problems, I think with continuous and prolonged use, there might be dependent upon the particular manufacturer and the type of seals they used. Uh, briefly in the 90s, when they first started introducing ozone being injected into commercial washing machines to eliminate the use of bleach and hot water, they found that they didn't really necessarily do all the homework they needed to do. And the seals were made of polyethylene. Well, within days, weeks, those seals were rotten and water was just pouring out the washer past the shaft. I mean, these are big machines and it's dumping gallons, gallons of water onto the motors and such. But what, what we found at that point was the ozone was damaging the seals. So the seals and dishwashers and washers, um, it depends what the manufacturer uses. If they're using a polyacrylate, a polyethylene, I would err caution on using anything that is acidic. I would lean more towards the manufacturer recommendations on what to use to remove mineral deposits. Baking soda seems to be pretty safe and neutral uh, when it comes to cleaning them type of things. Uh, but I would avoid heavily acidic things. So if you have rags, the biggest thing that I could say in anything, in my most experience of anything with kitchen rags as oils and cleaners, mop heads, is don't dry them. If you wash them, don't dry them. Spontaneous combustion could take place. I've been a part of many fires where I've actually watched a cart full of mop heads that haven't been washed sitting in a cart catch on fire next to me while I was repairing the washer for them to go into. And wow. it was a mixture of the chemicals. I've seen dryer fires with chemicals that hit the galvanized steel of the basket of the drum turning. And, and once the heat and the right variables were right, and they completed that fire triangle, created a fire. So I would say washer is probably okay unless it's very acidic. You're probably better just tossing it in the trash and getting rid of it uh, as long as it's not going to have any spontaneous combustion because we know dirty rags with oil can spontaneously ignite, uh, ignite if they're in a, a closed in container. But I think from a washer, you have least, the, the least amount of worry than you do with putting it in the dryer. And for those that are using microfiber cloths, one thing that I want to add is high heat for microfiber cloth will damage the fibers. Yep. And so one of the things that we recommend, it's easy to do and it's pretty inexpensive, but many people have a laundry room with a door on it. And if you if you are inside your home and you're doing this at your home, what we have are those, they're actually shoe racks where they have like little hooks and you put your shoes on them. 
and it has like, I don't know, 30 little places for shoes and it just hooks over the back of the door. And so when our microfiber cloths come out of the washing machine, we just shake them out and then we hang them over those little hooks. And so they're really shoe hooks, but we use them for microfiber cloths to dry our mop heads and our microfiber cloths. And that way they never have the high heat. And then instead of us trying to deal with it that way, as soon as they're dry, we just pull them off and fold them up and we're good to go again. So that's a quick tip. That's perfect. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple other questions um, and I wanted to go back to um, the uh, question that said, how often should I clean my fridge? That's a great question because most people have refrigerators and if we don't clean our fridges, like what happens? Is there anything bad if we don't maintain our fridge and how often should we keep those cleaned? Yeah, so when so there's different components, there's different sections, and, and there's different intervals at which you clean them. I clean the external part every single day. I wipe it down. I I got a, a I got the the mirrored glass, you know. So I, I use a different cleaning technique. It, it's just a microfiber cloth. I treat it like my TV. So if you got a refrigerator with a display like that, I use anti-static microfiber or what's called an e-cloth. Uh -huh. uh, that's great for those surfaces. Uh, for the stainless on the exterior, I wipe it down every day. I would say maybe once a week. You know, it wouldn't be problematic depending on use, how much you're at home, maybe once every two weeks. Uh, internally, uh, I would clean up spills immediately. But I would say, me personally, I would clean the interior of my refrigerator every one to two months. Uh, and then more importantly, what affects the operation of your refrigerator is cleaning the door gasket regularly. And that's just doing a simple spot check each week. If that door seal isn't tight against there, it's gonna leak cold air out or bring warm air in. And that makes your refrigerator fight harder. So if you can imagine that taking place and then your condenser coils are dirty as well. So it's fighting to keep set temperature, it's leaking air in, your refrigerator is gonna be exhausted. So cleaning your door gasket is hugely important, just doing spot checks weekly, cleaning it as needed. Uh, so that way, because what that could lead to is your evaporator coil leading up. And your freezer is what gets your refrigerator cold. And it does that by diverting the air into your refrigerator through a series of mechanical devices, diverters, and things like that. So if you take care of that pretty frequently, then you can kind of go with the rule of thumb about every six months cleaning the condenser coils. Um, it might be a little bit more frequent if you have pets, multiple pets, because their hair and the dander and the dirt can get in there even more as they shed, especially through seasons, you know, going from summer to winter, winter to summer, you know, moving that, they're going to shed. And that might get the condenser coil a little bit more dirty. And so to base on your, your, your specific circumstance at the intervals of what you clean your condenser coil, and the condenser coil is located at the back bottom of your refrigerator. If you're uncomfortable, I would hire a professional, but basically it's going to take, you've got leveling legs on the front. You have to kind of put them back up so the refrigerator can sit on the wheels. That way you can pull it forward. And as you pull it forward, you want to watch any water lines that are attached. You got a power cord that you need to be aware of and always unplug any appliance that you're doing this level of cleaning. If it's a simple wipe down, that's fine. You don't want to shut your refrigerator off to clean the interior because then it's going to take that much more to acclimate and get up to temperature, um, you know, and, and your freezer, you know, so it's helpful to do those things in the winter. Uh, clean those because the food can stay outside. You get a little bit more time to clean it. But if you're cleaning the condensing coils, the best thing you can do is a vacuum. And I would use a HEPA vacuum. You don't want a vacuum that's going to push particulates back into the, the, the room. Not everybody has a real big kitchen. So if you're sucking everything and it's blowing right out back behind you, you're getting the rest of your appliances dirty and then it's going to suck it right back in there. But a, a vacuum with uh, uh, some crevice nozzles, some narrow nozzles to get in there and a flexible appliance brush is super helpful. And if it's unplugged, you don't have to worry about the condenser fan coming on. The condenser fan purpose is to blow the air over the condenser coil to get rid of that heat so your refrigerator can run at its optimal performance. So when you start to have the, cumulate, the accumulating of lint on the condenser coil, coil and your door gas gets dirty, your refrigerator is like, please just help me out. I need some help here. I'm having problems keeping up the temperature. So those are some simple things. So one to three months on the condenser coils, if you have pets, six months max. Uh, and then I would just do uh, weekly spot checks on, on the rest of the surfaces and clean as necessary. 
That was so detailed and so helpful. Thank you so much. But now I want to go back one step. Yep. Give us the how-to of how we clean the door gaskets. How exactly do we do that? Absolutely. So first off, what do you want to avoid? You want to avoid anything that's going to dry that door gasket out. So avoid petroleum-based products. Avoid flammable. Your best thing is warm water or Mayo dish soap. I mean, if you think about it, we're not getting anything really on there that's too bad. We're not getting like cement, right? We're not getting those type of things. We're just getting some occasional, we got ketchup on our hand and we open the door and the kid closes it and runs on. You got some dried up ketchup on there. So I would say, you know, just for normal wipe down, warm water. If you start to notice debris on there, use a mild dish soap and you want to make sure you dry it afterwards because they kind of look like an accordion right if you look at the gasket and refrigerator it's kind of accordion they got grooves in there if we're getting food stuffs in there and moisture these organic materials start to produce mold so if you need to use a q-tip to get in there with a, a warm solution with mild dish soap by all means do that the cleaner you keep them the better. And in and, and some of the older model refrigerators, I found that when in, in my field, that we, when we pack out refrigerators and we prop the doors open so it doesn't grow mold, uh, sometimes uh, the things that you use deform the gasket and then you get this weird shape in the gasket. You can use a hair dryer to kind of warm that back up and use your fingers in a rag to kind of pull that back out and let it reform its natural state so that way it seals when you close the door it's, it's hugely important that that is a sealed compartment it's a closed system that is awesome thank you for sharing that with us and then you talked about looking for leaks where are we looking for leaks and how would we know if we had one in the door gasket um it, it's very hard to tell you're going to see more symptoms of you know, maybe ice cream melting. If it's the freezer that's not sealing correctly, you might pull something out and you drink it and you're like, this is a little bit warm. This doesn't mm -hmm. seem right, you know? Um, so those are some the visual indicators. It's hard to tell an air leak without like specialized professional tools. So what I would say is a, a visual look, you, you can, you can see it. Uh, the next thing would be to understanding, you know, what the products inside the refrigerator, are they, are they tasting warm? Do they feel warm? I need to address this uh, because that will freeze the evaporator coil. And then once that freezes, it's lost all its efficiency. And the first thing you're going to notice is the refrigerator warming up. Okay. So I would look for those type of things uh, to tell me that, yeah, it might be not sealing correctly. So if we maintain it then on a regular basis, we can prevent damaging it so that it is completely has to be replaced. Absolutely. Absolutely. And by regular maintenance, you can retain a lot of your manufacturer warranties. If you read through the warranties in the product manual, you'll see that there's exclusions for using inappropriate cleaners, not having regular maintenance. So, and that's what makes it great to, if you don't feel comfortable with it, using a professional cleaning company, they'll maintain those records, use manufacturer specifications in order that it should have a problem. You got a little bit more, um, you got a little bit more of a fight to go ahead and get things under warranty and get those repairs to taken care of. That is so helpful. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to add in because all of us have a refrigerator. I'm going to add this in as one of our top 10 tips that we clean our refrigerator on a regular basis and that we check the door seals, cleaning it with a damp cloth and just mild detergent and going over the accordion version of that. And in between, just making sure that there's no ketchup and there's no ketchup, uh, hot chocolate or whatever it is yeah. that you get on your fingers, jelly or jam or mustard yeah. <laughs> and make sure that it's clean and then check the quality of the food to make sure that it's cold and that stuff is freezing properly. And then every six months or so, I think, what did you say for the coils? One to three months or, or yeah, three six, to six months, months is pretty regular, but if you have animals or you're in an area where you have windows open and you're going to have a lot more pollen and dust being introduced into, into the environment, then I would check it at about three months and be able to make a determination that it's based on your special circumstance. And one thing I did want to point out too, is like my refrigerator recommend recommends that uh, you, you take about uh, I think it's like two tablespoons to a quart of water. You, so you take two tablespoons of baking powder and you stir it in water until it's completely dissolved because baking soda is, can, can be abrasive. It's not as abrasive as barkeeper's powder, uh, but you can use that to clean the walls of your refrigerator and your freezer. 
using that mixture and it'll help eliminate odors. That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay. So, and uh, one thing that I do want to recommend, and we didn't say this, but I just want to throw this out there for those of you that do not know. Um, James was really careful to say, if you are moving your refrigerator out, that you have to lift it up in order to, to access the wheels so that you can roll it. If you just pull it straight out, you can scratch the floors. So please, please, please be careful about that because if you just pull a refrigerator out and you're not paying attention, you can have great big scratches in your hardwood floor or scratches on your tile or whatever. So please be careful. And that's another reason why if you're not sure, hire a professional. That's right. That's right. When in I love it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so MCF says, what is the best way to clean cast iron stove grates? This is really a common one that comes up a lot because people have these amazing looking kitchens. And then those grates just get all kinds of food and stuff on them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first resort I would always go to is the manufacturer because they recommend Sub-Zero recommends some cleaners for their stainless steel, their abrasive powders, they got stainless steel. Uh, so it depends on the grade of all these things. But the first thing I would start with is the least minimal abrasive thing. And that's taking it in some hot water and some Dawn dish soap in there and letting it soak. Uh, I would use baking powder too. You can add a half a cup in the sink full of water, let it fully dissolve, and you can put it in there and even add some dish, uh, mild dish detergent, uh, and, and then just scraping them. And, and we all know too, matter of fact, like when I clean my cast iron pan, uh, I put water in it and I boil it. Mm -hmm. So that if it's big enough to fit in a pan, you might even want to boil it, all right? And be careful when you handle it. You're gonna want to make sure you're wearing, you know, the proper protection to not burn your hands, but to get off some of that, that heavy built on burned on grease, um, you know, that, that means you probably have a lot of boil overs, right. And it, and it can happen. Uh, but typically that that's like cast iron grill grates to what's on a stove is completely different to me in my experience. And I found success in just cleaning them with my old dish soap and they make nylon brushes that are kind of like a toothbrush. And they got like maybe a little spatula on the end for crevice cleaning a little to get into some places you normally can't reach without damaging the surface. Those are great. You can scrub them. Uh, you might even be able to use the well, a wet SOS pad. In a lot of cases, if you use, I think it's a number 000 steel wool pad, that mm -hmm. typically I don't think will hurt the cast iron. But I would want to look that up through the manufacturer to make sure that I'm not taking off any special finishes that that particular manufacturer may have used for that grill grate. So that's the first place I would start. If I had to go with a more aggressive cleaner, I, I would look across the board at what manufacturers are recommend, uh, what their recommendations are. So if that's something like simple green and you mix it to this ratio, uh, I think the biggest thing anybody has to look out for is how particular chemicals react with particular metals. And the only way to understand that is to read the manual. If it doesn't clearly indicate it, feel free to contact the manufacturer. Feel free to call a professional that are, that specializes in that uh, before applying it to anything. So that way, you don't. These are investments. Appliances are investments, and we want them to be around as long as we can, right? So proper care, continuous maintenance, and following the manufacturer recommendations are absolutely key in maintaining their longevity. I love that. I'm so glad that you said that. And I want to go back to something that you said earlier about reading the safety data sheets. The safety data sheet by the Globally Harmonized System has 16 different sections. And it will tell you in section one what the product is, and they will give you the information on the manufacturer. So there's a phone number right there in section one. It's the very first section in the uh, safety data sheet, and it's all across the board now. And so if you're not sure, get the safety data sheet. It's always available online. You just do uh, SDS, which is shortened for safety data sheet. And then the name of whatever it is that you're trying to use as far as the cleaning chemical. And it will tell you if it's safe to use. And the, the reason this is really important is because there are a lot of people that try to take shortcuts. They're like, oh, I have a stove and I'm using oven cleaner to clean the inside of my oven. Can I just spray this on the outside of my oven? Because if it's good for the inside, it must be good for the outside, right? And they make guesses. And when they do that, they're not paying attention to 
my stove is right next to my granite counter, which is right next to my wooden cabinets. And they go spraying the oven cleaner and it gets in other places that now it's damaged those other surfaces. And if you are a professional, I want to caution you on one thing and be very clear about this. You might have insurance and good for you if you do. However, here's the caveat. If you're using an oven cleaner, for example, and you're using it on something other than the inside of the oven for which it's intended, that chemical is inside your care, custody, and control, which means you know what you're doing and you know how to use it. And so if you file a claim for granite countertops or wooden, uh, wooden cabinets that you've damaged, or if it's the top of a stove top, which is the exterior that doesn't have the same enamel that the inside of the oven does, your insurance company is not going to cover the claim. And so if you're experimenting on customers' appliances, you did not read the manual, you do not know what you're doing, and you will be replacing it out of your own pocket. Absolutely. So I do want to caution you on that, which I cannot emphasize enough. If you're not 100% sure, pause Tell the customer that you will research their really expensive top end of the end of the world appliance and you will get back with them and do not experiment on their appliances if you're not sure. Do not. It's OK to say, I don't know. I've never seen a sub zero fridge or, or stove or whatever it is. I've never seen this brand before. Do you mind if I hold off on today's cleaning until I can research it and clean it properly? I'd hate to damage it. And I don't know any customer that spent a fortune on their appliances. It's going to go, no, nah, just go ahead and experiment. I'm cool with that. They will never do that. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Uh, so You're I'm glad we had this conversation. Right that. That's absolutely true. I've been a part of claims in, in the, the commercial uh, restoration that where claims were negated because of care, custody, and control. They allowed it to sit too long without it being properly mitigated, thereby degrading the surfaces. The surfaces, And yeah, their claim was negated. They, they had to pay out of pocket. Um, talking about um, stoves and appliances, though, what is the difference between gas and electric when it comes to cleaning? Because the products are different or are they the same? Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously, um, one, anytime I want to point out, anytime you clean an appliance where you're getting in deep, disconnect the power, make sure that it's not going to turn on. Because if you're wiping something and you inadvertently hit a knob and turn it on, you might be spewing gas. It might ignite a flame and your arms over it or you turn on an element. So always unplug. And, and, and disconnect the, the utilities. Gas is a bit more extensive in the cleaning because you got grates, you have burner caps, burner heads, and all these things need to be pulled off and cleaned in soapy water. That's where you wanna be really careful on what you use because some of the, the, the burner heads are aluminum and most commercial grade oven cleaners. I've, I know oven bright uh, is Bonzi is another commercial grade cleaner with Georgia chemical company that'll actually discolor. And in some cases melt the aluminum, even baking, wow. soda. baking soda has a negative effect to aluminum. So air caution on that. So when you clean those, it's about elbow grease and dish soap, you know, so you're going to be pulling a lot of those off. Uh, you never want to use a rag that's dripping wet. That in any case, because you can get into electrical components, you can get it into the crevices that go down into the insulation. If insulation gets wet, if it gets real wet, it can start to develop mold, you know, so you want to air caution on that and use, you know, wet rags, but not dripping wet. So when you clean a, a gas range, those are the components going to come off. So you got more removable parts that you're cleaning versus an induction or a flat top like mine. I'm going to use distilled water, uh, I'll wipe it. I don't want heavy. If I, if I lived in Southern Indiana, their water was so hard down there. It was just destroying some of the dry cleaning machines. So when you use that, you could be leaving residues of minerals and buildup. And if, especially if you use it in a, in an oven to use a steam to clean it like an easy clean and you pour water in the bottom of the oven, 
um, it can leave that mineral deposit behind once it's dried and, and is evaporated and you're just gonna have this film behind. So I would say if you're gonna ever clean with water, use uh, filtered tap water using a pure filter or something like that, or bottled water refraining from, you know, uh, any type of uh, water that could have minerals in it, you know, spring water, things like that. So if you use water that has less minerals, uh, that's great for cleaning because you don't get that residual after it's drying and gone. So cleaning electric, uh, avoiding the electrical elements in the back. If you have exposed elements, sometimes they're underneath, so you don't have to worry about it uh, as much. Uh, but you just want to avoid getting it too wet. You want to avoid uh, using baking soda or any type of oven cleaner on aluminum. Uh, ammonia can have some adverse effects. And you may not see these adverse effects from these chemicals right away, but continuous prolonged use over time starts to change the color, starts to damage the finish that the manufacturer intended to have this lifespan for this amount of time, you're shortening that, even though you don't see it, it's taking place. I'm so glad that you brought up all of those tips. One of the tips that I wanna hang on to, and this is really important, and I think this is true for all of the electrical appliances, is, and this is one of our, our 10 tips of the day, is if you're cleaning an electrical appliance, please unplug it before you start doing any of the heavy duty cleaning. And this is because we want to make sure that it doesn't come on automatically when you, for, for example, you've got your hand down the, di the garbage disposal or something, make sure that it's turned off so that it's not just going to, something's going to happen. Or if you are changing, replacing those, cleaning the coils of your refrigerator, you want to make sure that that's unplugged. And so if you are doing some heavy duty cleaning, please either turn them off or just flip the breaker so that it's not going to come on automatically and like, attack you okay because we don't want any weird things happening um can you talk to us for a second about um self-cleaning ovens i know yeah, that for, yeah that is, that is something that i've personally had some issues with where the builders built them into cabinets that were so close to the cabinets that when they heated up to that the high temperatures it ca it caught the cabinets on fire and now we have house fires in the kitchens Ooh. so that's a great point I'm just going to be honest and transparent. I'm not a fan of self-cleaning. Self-cleaning will take that appliance to like 900 degrees. So it's like sitting in your car, in park, putting your foot on the gas and watching that rev that RPM go up and just, wah, 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 you're running it, you're running it. It's the same thing with your oven. And interestingly enough, what you're cooking off, the fumes that are produced, anytime you get a new oven, right? You heat it up, you can actually smell the paint and the materials and the oils that they use in the manufacturing process coming off. Well, we never get it totally hot enough to get even more of that out. And plus the cooked on things that we have, when we heat it up to 900 degrees, it's taken all its components to the highest parameter that it can withstand. And we're pushing the limits. And then like you said, the sides are going to get hot. And depending on the manufacturer and the quality of it, it might not have as much insulation so the fumes that are coming off they're going to tell you if you read manuals take birds out of the area remove them from the room open all the doors all the windows uh that's red flags for me you don't want kids or pets around because they can walk by brush it and get burnt so i don't like the self-cleaning function because of that because of the risk because i know through normal spot checks cleaning weekly, cleaning after every use, I don't have to use those aggressive techniques, methods, and all that to in order to clean my oven so I can cook a pizza or I can cook a pie. Those are two things that continually boil over. They're always, so I would say, if you want to reduce that, get a silicone mat. They make silicone mats that go in there. They go up to about 500 degrees. You're perfectly fine putting it in there and it makes cleanup easy. But if you do get some spillage over, before you heat it up the next time and fill your house up with all these soot molecules, that's what it is. It's soot molecules. It's taking this food and just heating it up and it's dispersing everywhere. Uh, you can use um, some plastic scrapers. These razor blades, there's plastic razor blades as well. They sell them in kits where you have one handle is a razor and the other is a plastic. Those are great. And if you may not want to go in and just start using elbow grease and scraping it off, I would make a, a baking soda paste uh, and just hit that one spot. 
let it sit for a little bit and then scrape it off and then wipe it with the rags as, as we've already discussed. If you have aluminum, you decide to put aluminum on the bottom and you peel it off and you got little chunks staying back. Use some dish soap and a, a few squirts in a, in a cup, pour it in there. Typically, it'll have a cavity. You don't want it to go over enough that it drips into the lower pan or into any crevices, but you can put it in there and, and let it rest a little bit, let it start to dissolve that, and you can typically scrape it right off with a plastic scraper. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think one of the things that we need to really pay attention to when it comes to the oven, and I want to go back for a minute to something that James just said. When we talk about the self-cleaning oven, because I get this question at least 10 times a week, um, the self-cleaning oven is a feature that a lot of people like because it is available. But just because it is available does not mean it's the best way that you should clean your oven. And there are people who have at one time used a chemical spray like an easy off or something like that to clean the oven. And now they want to try to use the self-cleaning oven. And what James just said, and I want to really pay attention to this, if at one point you added extra chemicals and now you're heating it up to the 900 or 1,000 degrees and it's just like overkill, what has happened now is those chemicals that you once used to spray to clean the oven are now heating up so hot that you better get out of the house if you're going to do it. And I don't recommend doing the self-cleaning oven if you're not physically on the property. Because I have been in homes where the homes have caught fire. And something that they don't tell you in pretty much anywhere is if you use a, a self-cleaning oven and the cupboard does catch fire, they the, the self-cleaning oven will say ventilate, right? Open all the airs and windows. But if you have a fire that starts, oxygen fuels a fire. And so you need the windows closed if there's a fire because you don't want it to feed the fire, right? So if the oven is too hot and it catches fire and you have the windows open, thank you for ventilation, bad for ventilation because now the rest of your house is going to catch fire. So it, it doesn't make any sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense. And I've been in neighborhoods where there were five homes. Like I, I, I was cleaning a home when I caught somebody's stove on fire. Their oven, oven caught fire because she did the self-cleaning oven. I was on the premise when it happened. And there were five neighbors that came over and go, oh, that, that happened to so-and-so through the block. There were five homes in the neighborhood that had caught fire because the builder built the, in the cabinets where they put the oven inside the cabinet. Oh. It was too close and they, it just caught oven fires. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's not that the builder was negligent. Maybe they didn't know that the ovens were going to heat up that hot, but it was a common thing. And so we started sending out memos to everyone saying, hey, listen, please do not use your self-cleaning oven. Please do not. And so I just want you to be aware if you do. There are people that have used it successfully and they love it and that's great. But please be aware there are issues. And if you are a professional house cleaner, you do not want to find yourself in a situation where you just burn down a customer's home. I promise you that from experience. <laughs> and I want to add, that's a great point. And, and that really gets me thinking. So one thing I want to add is like anytime you self-clean, you got to pull the racks. They say you can leave the porcelain in there, but it'll discolor your racks and then they won't mm -hmm. fit right. But mm -hmm. here's what it is to your point of, hey, I do it. I did this and I didn't have any problem. Well, there's a thing called pyrolysis and pyrolysis is in, in the fire world is what causes flashovers and everything. It's just the decay of the materials. So if you use the self-clean and it's in a cabinet like that, it may not happen right then, but that heat is changing the combustibility of the materials that are around it through pyrolysis. It just continually gets hot and hotter and hotter, and it starts to heat out the natural oils in there until one day it happens. So it's a lot like playing Frogger. You know, you may get across up to level three, but level four, they got you. Well, and it's it's also the fumes. It, like I said, if you use a spray and then you try to use the self-cleaning oven, those fumes become so incredibly toxic that you can't you cannot stay in the house. You cannot stay in the house. And they do say, get your birds out of the house. Get your birds, your cats, your dogs, get everybody out of the house and people too. I had a, a gentleman call me one time and he was in a panic. And he said, uh, my house stinks really, really bad. And the fumes are so bad. It's burning our throats. What do we do? And I said, how did you get this way? And he said, well, we just turned on the self-cleaning oven, but we have always used the spray instead. And I said, get out of the house, open your windows and get out of the house. Just get out of the house, turn off the breaker, make sure that you turn it off so that you can stop the process. Get out of the house because whatever you're breathing right now, it's already burning your lungs and your throat. Yep. 
So I hate that. It's horrible. Please don't don't play dumb games. If you play dumb games, you win dumb prizes, as That's they right. say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, do you have any advice for uh, cleaning hoods and filters? I know lots of people have like grease and stuff that goes up there and then it's kind of a mess. Absolutely. So there's two types of filters. Uh, there's metal and charcoal. Uh, charcoal, you typically just replace. That's replaced annually or about 120 hours of cooking time. Uh, that's a good rule of thumb to use. Um, as far as the metal, you're going to have a couple different types. You're going to have baffle, which is tends to be mostly stainless. Then you're going to have a mix of uh, aluminum and stainless steel for the mesh. Uh, so like any type, the thing that has aluminum, avoid putting it in the dishwasher. Avoid using any type of corrosive cleaner on it, baking soda, things like that. You can do a quick little research and find the things that are that will react negatively, like ammonia, with uh, with that aluminum. So pull them out. Uh, anytime that you have the heavy cooking season, like the holidays, even if you're not cleaning the whole range and hood, at least clean the filters, pull them, set them in some hot water. Um, and it always goes back to the manufacturer. I've read some manufacturers recommendations on using ammonia for the stainless steel baffle type. You put them in a trash bag with ammonia, set it outside and you can do the whole rinsing. I'm not a big fan of using anything that has heavy fumes. I like green approaches, easy, and just staying consistent. It works for me. Um, as far as the mesh, I would soak them in hot soapy water, making sure that I rinse them completely to get rid of all soap residue, and then making sure that they're fully dry. Um, once you remove the filters uh, up inside, if you got any grease that's sitting there, you can make that baking soda water paste. Uh, you know, with, I think it's like a half a cup to a few tablespoons of baking soda with a little toothbrush. And you can just put it on the spot, let it sit 15, 20 minutes, scrape it off and wipe it clean. But what I want to stress that's most important is doing everything you can to use a flashlight and look up where the fan is and see if you can see up in the duct. If you're starting to see an accumulation of grease, it's time to call out the professionals and have that vent clean because that could create a structure fire. Um, so hoods are sucking in all that. You can get heavy splatter. And maybe if you don't you start to neglect the filters, it's just going to continually move through till it gets up past the filters. So, but as long as you're maintaining it and going, you don't have to do that as much, but the further neglect you do, the more extreme measures you're going to have to take. And I would really call out a professional so they can look at the most cost-effective solution for you as a homeowner to ensuring that your risk, you're mitigating all these risks of structure fires or any type of damage or failure. And I'm really glad that you brought that up because there are little tiny things that we can do when we cook. There are ways that we can cook like with lids and things like that, that will help contain some of the grease. And from a cleaning perspective, please, please, please contain all of your grease. When it goes up the sides of your cupboards and it gets on the ferns that are above your cabinets and everything, and it gets on your trinkets and your ornaments and it's thick in the air, and then it settles on all of your stuff. It's, it's just a mess and it's hard to, it's hard to clean because then when the dust kicks through your house, it sticks on that grease and it's, it's just nasty. Um, so please, I, I love what James is saying about regular maintenance. So thank you very much. Um, what, and I would, I would be remiss. I have to ask this question. This is another one that we get asked a lot. It's about the uh, plastic or the, the rim. We see it oftentimes in either the garbage disposals where we get lots of gunk there or inside the washing machine in those front load washing machines where there's a, a gasket, a big gasket. And then like there's this little overlap and there's gunk that gets in there and then it molds. How do we clean those? Yeah, so great point. What's going to help you clean your garbage disposal is going to help your dishwasher because oftentimes the dishwasher is connected to your garbage disposal. Uh, so a lot of them, if you do some research, you'll see that they say not to use the ice cube and the lemon wedge technique. Simply what you can do is get uh, kind of like a, a, a baby bottle brush or a beaker brush. And you can use some dish soap and mild detergent, some warm water. You can clean out the rubber baffles that go down into it. And then what you can do is just simply pour some, um, you know, vinegar down in there. Uh, and then uh, while you're letting that, you use, I think, of like maybe a half a cup of baking soda and a cup of vinegar. You can pour that down in the garbage disposal. Let it sit. Okay. And by the way, 
cut the power off before you're sticking that brush down in the garbage disposal and don't stick your hand in there. It's not necessary. You can clean those baffles and get that off. Uh, but when you got the power off and you put the baking soda and vinegar in there and letting it sit, boil a small pan of water, a couple cups of hot water. And then you can, once that's boiling, you can go over there after 10, 15 minutes and pour that down the drain. That'll get rid of a lot of that gunk that's built up that causes a lot of odor. I'm sure you can smell it when your dishwasher starts to drain. You can smell that kind of rotten egg smell. It, it may not always be coming from your dishwasher. You might be getting the smell from that, that disposal. So keeping that clean is super helpful. And then once you get that down in there, you can establish power again and then run some water and just let the garbage disposal run for about a minute and let it rinse out. That's great for the garbage disposal. But I will once again, always refer to the manufacturer to ensure that, you know, you understand the components that are inside there. So if there happens to be an aluminum part, you know, you're not causing any damage. So really all this boils down to is doing your research on what you own. Um, mm -hmm. As far as washers, uh, that bellows that or that membrane that goes between the tub on a front loader and that door, um, really it's wiping it dry every time. So as you pull the clothes out, like once you wash clothes, get them out of there promptly because the more they sit, they start to build up mildew and they can stink even after a few hours, you know, even more so if you leave them in there for a day. But if you continually keep that dry and just kind of pull that out and keep it dry, that's great. Um, I, I would use that. Uh, I would not use any aggressive detergents or anything like that. They, they do sell like pods that you can put in a dish or I'm sorry, in a washing machine and run it. Uh, so if you're performing that maybe two, three times a year uh, and then you're doing sort of, um, you know, throwing some baking soda in the washer and running that on a cycle with no loads in it, that can help you because the thing that you want to prevent, if you want to prevent mold and this buildup in your machines, really avoid using fabric softener and overuse of detergents. Fabric softener, we tend to overuse. It coats everything. It starts to coat the, the screens for your drain pump, and that can cause issues. In your dryer, it can coat the sensors, and now it can't operate at its set temperature. So you can put a load in, and it kind of overheats. It goes past the set point. So if it's 180 degrees, by the time that heat gets through the sensor and that sticky fabric softener and got lint sticking to it, now it's going way higher. And because of the differential, it's going back down before that cycles its heat on and off, maybe a 15 deg degree differential. But the dirtier it gets, the more you overuse these detergents and fabric softeners, it coats these components and it starts to put them out of the operational parameters. So now you got this big window of turning off and on. Now you got extended dry times. You have a washer that's not dra draining as efficiently as it should. So that might cause a problem during spin of getting the water out fast enough and you get what's called in the world is called carryover. So if I'm using a bath, we called a liquor mix in, a, in back in the day when we did that, it was a dose of chemicals in a bath. Once you go from that detergent bath to the next bath, you don't want detergents, you're going through a rinse. But carryover can carry over some of those detergents if it's not draining properly. And the use, overuse of these products can absolutely attribute to that. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, as a house cleaner, I can't tell you how many times a week I get the question, how do we clean out that inside rim? And I love the front load washing machines. They're so convenient. They're just awesome. And I, it's fun to watch the clothes spinning around. But the, the clothes, and I want us to just walk through this logically for just a second. The clothes are being washed so there's water inside. There's moisture inside. And so when we open the door, we're, we've been told and trained to leave the door open after the wash so that it can air out. But because of the folds of the bellows of that rim that goes between the door and the drum of your washing machine, what happens is it folds over and it's kind of like it's closing a little door to trap everything inside. And you have to kind of open it up and with the dry cloth, clean that out. And I'll share a secret with you. They sell these little stick on hooks. You can find them at the hardware store, at Walmart or whatever. And they're just, they, you just peel the little sticker off and you stick it on and it doesn't damage if you peel it off. It's like a little, what do you call it? A command strip thing. And you just stick it on the side of the dryer with a terry cloth. And the terry cloth is just a simple cloth that will hang on the side of your washing machine or dryer. And when you open the laundry, 
if you'll take that cloth and you'll clean out the inside of that, you'll dry that with like half of the cloth, flip the cloth over and then wipe the inside of the glass door so that that's dry and wipe around the seal of that as well. And if you will wipe those two areas and you will keep those areas dry and you can just, it's, it's clean because you've just done a load of laundry. You can just hang your cloth back up there and let it dry. And then every couple of times, throw it in the washing machine and wash it and let it go through a cycle. But if you will keep that dry after every single load, it will keep your washing machine really nice. But once you get to the point where you've got mold and hair gunk and all the, the stuff that's trapped in there, because it does, it traps hair and bobby pins and hair elastics and whatever else goes through the dryer, Q-tips, if it's anything that's in your pocket, receipts or whatever, it will trap all that inside that rim. So clean that out and then dry it and your washing machine will be so much happier. Absolutely. So I, I love that as a tip. Um, our time is up. I, our time is up. Oh my goodness. It, <laughs> it did. And I knew this would happen. I have learned so much. This has been so incredibly helpful. Um, James, please tell our listeners where they can go to find you, learn more about you. Absolutely. So uh, my email, uh, I'm always monitoring that. It's james.copeland at prismspecialties.com. Feel free to email me. As I said, I'm constantly uh, monitoring it because, as I said, I'm the commercial go-to guy for my entire network. So as commercial claims come in, uh, they're contacting me, and that is usually a knee-jerk reaction to react quickly. Uh, so I'm constantly monitoring. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have. I'm happy to help the masses. Well, thank you so much. And also, I'm going to leave links in the notes below to James website, as well as his email address. And just if you have any questions, I know there are a lot of questions we didn't get to today. Uh, we had several people that said, uh, how about a top loader machine? I want to answer that in the questions below after we're over. Um, Narell says, thank you very much. You guys, thank you so much for, for joining us today. This was just absolutely awesome to have you here. I really appreciate you guys joining us. And James, I appreciate your time and attention today. You have been immensely helpful as we move through the new year to take care of the appliances that we've invested so much in. Thank absolutely. you very much for today. Thank you. Happy New Year.